Buenos días a todos, bienvenidos a nuestros seminarios del Instituto de Biología de la UNAM. Eh, tenemos eh, esos seminarios eh, virtuales todos los martes a las 11 de la mañana. Eh, así los pueden disfrutar eh, quedándose en su casa con un rico café. Entonces, el próximo martes vamos a tener el seminario del doctor Arturo Becerra de la Facultad de Ciencias de la UNAM que nos van a hablar del tema de los primeros 2.000 millones de años de vida en la Tierra. Y hoy tenemos el gran placer de estar con el profesor Peter Kennedy de la University of Minnesota. Eh, Peter obtuvo su eh, bachillerato en el Evergreen State College y su doctorado en la University of California, Berkeley. Él ha publicado más de 60 artículos indexados y capítulos de libros y ha supervisado 12 estudiantes de doctorado y 4 postdocs hasta el día de hoy. Eh, su investigación se enfoca en la ecología microbiana, en particular con asociaciones eh, ectomicorísicas. Y se enfoca en particular en los mecanismos ecológicos y, evolu eh, y de evolución que eh, entre la, la especificidad de hospederos de eh, hongos ectomicorísicos, en particular en eh, ecosistemas tropicales, como eh, él nos va a hablar hoy. Y también le interesa eh, estudiar las respuestas de esas asociaciones a condiciones ambientales eh, cambiantes. Eh, entonces, el día de hoy nos va a presentar su seminario en inglés, eh, y si tienen preguntas durante el seminario, los pueden hacer usando el chat en vivo de YouTube que se encuentra a la derecha de su pantalla, que yo creo que es aquí. Eh, y por supuesto pueden hacer las preguntas en inglés y en español, porque Peter entiende muy bien español. <ríe> y nosotros los podemos traducir también. Entonces, ahora voy a pasar al inglés. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the seminar series of the Institute of Biology of UNAM. We are having those seminar every Tuesday at 11 uh, during the time of the quarantine. And so today I have the great pleasure to be with Peter Kennedy from the University of Minnesota. Hello Peter, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you Camille. So Peter is uh, actually in Merida in Mexico today. Uh, because he's doing some work that he will present today about ectomycorrhizal association in the tropics. Uh, Peter uh, uh, has a bachelor from the Evergreen State College and a PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. He is currently associate professor at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he has published more than 60 uh, research articles and book chapters and has supervised uh, 12 a PhD student and four postdocs. His uh, investigation uh, is focusing on the ecology and evolution of ectomycorrhizal association, in particular in the tropics. And he's also interested in addressing ecosystem associated responses of fungi to changing environmental con uh, conditions. So thank you, Peter, for being with us today. <laughs> And I'll let you start your presentation. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to switch into hopefully the full screen mode. And uh, let's see, is this in full screen, Camille? Yes, okay? exactly. Yes, right. thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today about some of the research that we've done. Seeing that live chat um, is great. There's a number of uh, people who I recognize uh, saying hi. So thank you all for attending. Thank you very much, Camille, for this invitation. Uh, I feel like I have a special connection with UNAM. Um, uh, actually, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to work at UNAM when Roberto Garibay Orihel was starting his lab. And um, I am really uh, fortunate to maintain that connection with him and other researchers. And um, today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the research that I've had the opportunity to work on um, in my sabbatical. So I've spent part of the year in Mexico and part of the year in Colombia. And so the title of the talk is Exploring the Ectomycorrhizal Niche of Ectomycorrhizal Fun or the Ecological Niche of Ectomycorrhizal Fungi in Lowland Neotropical Dry and Wet Forests. Um, and I will say that I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not giving this talk in Spanish. I feel like I'll be more clear if I give it in English. So apologies. But as Camille said, I've 
happily welcome questions in Spanish at the end, and we'll happily try to respond in Spanish uh, as best I can. All right, so in terms of uh, the seminar today, I'd like to talk about um, a few different things. And so in the beginning, I just want to briefly talk a little bit about fungal ecology and a tool that we have used, and I hope the community can also use to help them understand more about the ecology of these fascinating organisms. From there, then I'll shift gears into thinking about ectomycorrhizal fungi and that symbiosis in tropical forests, both wet and dry forests. And so I'll focus in the beginning on the first study, which is looking at the structure of fungal communities, particularly ectomycorrhizal fungal communities and neotropical dry forests. And then some new work that I've actually started in collaboration during the sabbatical um, with folks in Colombia, looking at the community structure of ectomycorrhizal fungi and neotropical wet forests in the Amazon. Okay, so briefly to start off with why study fungi, um, well, I think there's lots of reasons, but I'd like to start here because as an ecologist, I actually find fungi pretty fascinating, particularly for the fact that they have both a way of interacting with the environment that is very small. So they're very much like other microorganisms where their spores are on the micron size, they interact with these microscopic hyphae, and so they can be very much like a microbe, and yet at the same time, they can be big. And so they make mushrooms that many of us enjoy going out into the forest to collect. And actually, as individuals, they can be some of the largest and longest lived organisms that we have on this planet. And so in many ways, I think they make a great system to bridge the microbial and microbial worlds in a way that allows us to ask interesting ecological questions. In addition, uh, fungi are really one of the big lineages that still has lots of diversity left to describe to science. And so the estimates are that we know something like 5% of all the fungi that are on this planet. And certainly in terms of their effect on ecosystems, there's lots of reasons and lots of great explanations and I guess demonstrations of the fact that fungi are important and integral to the functioning of both uh, natural and man-made ecosystems. So when we think about the study of fungi, and we think about characterizing fungal communities, um, I think that you know in the last couple of decades, we've really shifted into a mode where when we think about characterizing fungal communities in the field, that is often done with high throughput sequencing. That's really become sort of the main tool that we use to characterize fungal communities. I actually think of high throughput sequencing as a tool that is one that democratizes the field and the study of mycology in two ways. One is that usually when we take a sample that we then sequence for the fungal community that's present, depending on which primers we use, if we use general primers, we get all of the fungi at once. So instead of just studying one particular group or clade of fungi, whether it's from a taxonomic perspective, from an ecological perspective, we're actually looking at all of the fungi, which I think is important. The second is that there are lots of people who are not classically trained as mycologists who can use these methods to study fungal communities along with other microbial communities in soil or other questions that involve fungi in new and exciting ways. For me, one of the big questions though is with this sort of mass of big data that we're getting from high throughput sequencing, how do we maximize the ecological signal in high throughput sequencing based data sets? And so, there are a number of advances that have been made, but I want to talk to you about one today that actually is, I think, hopefully helpful for you as a tool and one for you as a contributor that can help us build this tool in a way that will make it grow through community effort. So if we think about ways to analyze fungal communities, one of the things that often is originally or was originally done was to analyze these communities based on taxonomy. So that would be something that might look like this. And so we have a pie chart on the left side here. And so this is just one particular study, but we've divided things up by the various phyla that are in the kingdom fungi. And on the right side, we have a part chart that is slightly more divided. In this case, now we're looking at uh, the classes of different fungi that are present in these various samples. And so I would say as an ecologist that that is a step forward, instead of treating all fungi as if they're ecologically identical, um, this does help. That said, I think there are some limitations to a taxonomy based, or at least a taxonomy only approach. And so what I mean by that is that taxonomy and ecology, they're not always linked. And so there are a number of examples, and these are a few. So my favorite group of fungi, the ectomycorrhizal fungi, this particular lifestyle is one that's highly polyphyletic, and so it's evolved many, many different times from many different groups of fungi. And so it doesn't necessarily track the taxonomy as well as say other particular traits. 
Another example is that we can have, say, functionally within a group that we know from a taxonomic perspective is one um, that can have very different outcomes. So brown and white rot are two different ways that wood rot, sapertrophs, um, degrade wood. And yet, if we treated them just based on taxonomy as basidia mycetes, we would lump them all together. So the other approach that I think is important is that mycology, uh, I think while an exciting uh, and really collaborative interactive field is one that's relatively small. And so the more we can make it accessible to more scientists, I think the better off we are. And the taxonomic approach is if you use that approach and you begin to move down into orders, family, genera, and species, it becomes challenging for non-mycologically trained ecologists to follow. So there are some other ways to think about describing fungal communities. And so we've worked on one in particular that focuses on the idea of function. So here you've got various pictures of lots of different types of fungi and their various activities. And this is based on the idea that there are guilds. And so this is a group of species, whether related or not, that exploits their environments in a similar way. And so this is one where they're not necessarily taxonomically related, but in terms of their functioning, they have some similarity. So this guild-based inference is one that I think does have some real advantages. In particular, one thing that it does is it takes these very complex communities. So fungal communities tend to be highly diverse. Within a small amount of soil, we have thousands of different species. If we can put them into various, in this case, guilds, we can put them into more manageable ecological units, which can oftentimes help us better understand what's going on with those communities. Another thing is that it shifts the focus, in this case, uh, onto probably what a lot of people are really interested in, which is what are fungi actually doing in those various ecosystems where we're studying them. So it moves from a focus on one that's about diversity to one that often is focused more on the functioning of that diversity. And importantly, this also allows us to make comparisons across diverse ecosystems that don't necessarily have the exact same species, OTU, even genera uh, present, and yet we can look at different ecosystems and by using a guild-based functional approach, we can make comparisons about the structure of those guilds in very different ecosystems. Um, so those are some advantages to thinking about this approach. So one of the issues that comes up is that as we think about high throughput sequencing, and I don't have time to get into the details, but I think a lot of you are generally familiar with what this is, is this molecular approach gives us a lot of data. And so typically what you end up with is a table that looks something like this, where you have a number of different columns and each of your various rows is a OTU, or you can think of as a species, depending on how well it can be identified. And then the subsequent columns are your samples, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And so it quickly becomes something that we can no longer manually um, score each of these different OTUs and their samples as to what their guild assignments would be, given that there are typically thousands of OTUs and hundreds of samples. And so one of the questions that we were originally positing was how can we automate this assignment? And so what we've done is we've built a database and we've come up with a tool that allows us to connect that database with our own research, as well as the research of anybody who's interested in using this database. And so I have the blue box here, and so you see the researchers, and so we would generate some sort of OTU table. Um, and that can be, again, based on molecular methods. It can be based on other methods. Some taxonomy is assigned to each of those different OTUs in all those different samples. And then the database is one that has a number of features, but it has, um, again, lots of entries. So we're up to about 13,000 entries. We've broken this down into three big trophic modes. So thinking about, in this case, sapertrophs is the kind of classic way people think about fungi pathotropes being ones that are attacking living hosts, and then symbiotropes, and the diversity of that is large, but ones that don't have negative effects, um, but are interacting closely with another organism. There are multiple guilds that we've identified, and there are ways to break out other guilds, as I'll talk about in a minute. The taxonomy is provided, and we try to provide as much metadata as we can. And so what we've done is we've written a simple script, and that script basically allows you to import the OTU table, connect it with the database, and then return your OTU table with the guild assignments attached to exactly the same table that you put into it. So I hope that um, <clears throat> there are some attributes to FunGuild that uh, I think make it uh, an important tool that could be used by more folks. And so I want to talk about a few of them. Um, one of the things that I think makes FunGuild work well is that all of us have oftentimes when we use molecular techniques, 
um, been used to using a particular gene region or a particular bioinformatics platform, FunGuild functions after all of that process. And so if you have a particular favorite gene region or bioinformatics platform, as long as you can generate an OTU table with taxonomy assigned to it, you can apply this guild-based approach to whatever that is. And so I see that as a significant advantage. It works based on the taxonomy that's assigned to those OTUs. So I'm happy to talk more about some of this later, but that is, I think, in one way, an advantage to this particular database. Um, secondly, is that as long as you have a taxonomy, you don't necessarily have to be working with molecular data. And so this could be based on sporocarp surveys. And so you could go out and look at the mushroom communities that are present in various ecosystems or some other way of scoring this community. And as long as there's a taxonomy there, again, you can access the database and have it linked to your particular data set. Um, and so I hope that that's another function that makes it work well. Finally, we've tried our best to, in this case, bridge the gap between classically trained mycologists and people who are interested in studying fungi but don't necessarily know that literature. And so the assignment of the guilds and the other traits in FunGuild is based on, to the best extent that we can, primary literature references. So this is what it looks like. And so again, you have this table where you start off with your OTU table, and you have a number of samples, and then you get this set of assignments that comes back attached to your table. And so you have these different trophic modes, you have the guild, you have some level of confidence. And so this is something that we as the Fun Guild team have tried to assign. This is often a balance between what the taxonomic uh, sort of level of identification is relative to what we know about its ecology. And so there are some genera that have split ecologies. And so it could be possible to be both ectomycorrhizal and an undefined saprotroph, as we see here for this Entoloma spa, that's the OTU4 in this data set. There's some notes, there's some traits, and there's, again, the citations to help you then, as the user, go into the literature and hopefully make a more informed decision. And so one thing that I do hope is that you don't use FunGuild and take the, the output, the default output, as where you stop. If you look further into the ecology of these different OTUs that you have, I think you can use this as a successful starting point. But it shouldn't just be, I think, the end used as, uh, as it is. So where is this tool? So there's a number of places that this tool exists. One place is on GitHub. And so you can see here at the bottom that we have a GitHub page and all the various things that you need, including the Python script as well as the database, um, are available. Um, there's an interactive version. So Scott Bates is one of the uh, core members of the FunGuild team. Uh, he's really the, the brains and brawn of this operation. And so uh, Scott has done a great job of setting up this interactive online version where you can simply load your OTU table um, and then you can have it run the analysis and output that OTU table with the guild assignments attached to it. So that's one place to look for that. And this is a paper that um, summarizes uh, the FunGuild database and some of the known issues with that database and some of the efforts that we've made to improve it. But the biggest thing that I want to emphasize here is that it's an open annotation tool. And so this is a tool that's meant to be one that is community sourced. And so we hope that we've started uh, with these 13,000 different entries, a good place. But if you have particular insight and knowledge or you have a guild that you've worked on that you want to have included, we want to include it in Fungal, in, sorry, in FunGuild to make it more user friendly uh, to people who don't necessarily know your guild or your area of expertise. And so adding more entries is something that we're always trying to do. And there's examples of how to do that. That can be automated or you can contact me or uh, Scott, for example. Adding, for example, we recently added uh, dung associated fungi as a guild. That's a group of fungi that tend to associate with dung of various types. And so we've added that as one of the guilds that is now in the database. Ideally, we would really like to, again, provide as fine scale ecological resolution as possible. And so we have a large bin of what we call undefined saprotrophs. And so we don't know exactly what kind of saprotroph they are. This is different than, say, a wood saprotroph, like I talked about with the brown and wood rock fungi. And so if we can take some of the saprotrophs that are in that bin and put them in other more specific gills, I think we can have a better uh, ecological perspective on their functioning. So thinking about taking litter saprotrophs, leaf litter saprotrophs out of this larger undefined guild. And finally, adding more trait information. So we've added soft rot as another type of rot as a trait that many wood saprotrophs use in addition to the classic brown rot and white rot mechanisms. 
Okay, so that's a little primer. I will explain more about why I emphasize that, um, but uh, I think it hopefully, again, is a tool that you might find helpful, and I would love to have contributions uh, to make this tool be even more successful. Okay, so switching gears into ectomycorrhizal symbiosis in tropical forests. So when we think about mycorrhizal types, I'm gonna go with uh, the hopefully knowledge that both locally at UNAM, you have fantastic people studying mycorrhizal fungi. You also had a great speaker a couple weeks ago, Mark andre Salos, talk about some of his research on mycorrhizal fungi. So I'm not gonna go all the way back to what is a mycorrhiza, but um, there are some important differences. And so I'm focusing on the ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so those are often, in this case, I will abbreviate them as the ECM symbiosis. And for a long time, the ecological dogma has been that these ECM symbioses are really quite rare in tropical forests with only a couple of exceptions. And so the most notable exceptions are the ones that involve the monodominant ectomycorrhizal forests. And this spans multiple continents. So there are examples in the Americas, in Africa, as well as in Asia. And then, of course, because the tropics is really just a set of lines on the map, there are actually some high elevation forests um, that have temperatures that are not particularly tropical per se, but they have host lineages in this case that are very common in temperate latitudes um, that are also present in the tropics. So that would be things like the oaks, the alders, and the pines, and there are other examples there. Fortunately, there's been a surge of research over the last um, particularly couple of decades um, that have shown that we have, I guess, underestimated the tropics as a place for the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis. And so Adriana Corrales and other members of folks that have done a lot of research in the tropics, both Terry Hankel and Matt Smith, published a very nice summary. Um, and here's they show this as one of the figures in the paper. And so in terms of studies of tropical ectomycorrhizal fungi, there's been this real surge. Um, and I think there are a number of causes, and these aren't mutually exclusive, but here are at least a couple of different reasons why I think there's been change. Um, mostly, I think uh, there's been known lineages. Um, so these are host plant lineages, uh, the Nictaginaceae, Pleganaceae, EAC, um, that are all known to be ectomycorrhizal hosts, but haven't really received much study, and that has changed. There's been more work on those different groups and looking to see if there are ectomycorrhizal associations present. Excitingly, there's also been new lineages that have been discovered, and this is some work that actually has come out of UNAM, and so uh, a big uh, congrats um, uh, to Roberto and particularly Julieta uh, Alvarez, who have done some really great work in tropical dry forests in Mexico, and has shown that there is, again, lineages of plants that are associated with ectomycorrhizal fungi that we didn't know before. Um, and finally, using these high throughput sequencing methods, these have now become more and more common in studies of tropical forests, and so detecting ectomycorrhizal fungi with these sort of powerful tools that allow us to sample more of the community more uh, quickly um, has allowed us to detect ectomycorrhizal fungi, I think, more regularly in soils than was possible before. So now I'm going to switch into the first of the two studies um, that I will present today. And so this is a study looking at neotropical dry forests. And so uh, as I'm sure all of you are aware, there are, of course, many different types of biomes in the tropics. Um, famously, there's the tropical rainforest, which I'll talk about in just a bit. But the tropical dry forests are well distributed across the tropics. Um, and the tropical dry forests are really, I would say, unique because of the fact that there is a lot of, they have very high functional diversity and they have very high endemism. So the types of plant communities and probably other types of communities in these tropical dry forests are quite distinct from other habitats. Um, importantly too, these are areas that are critically threatened by fragmentation. So they tend to be areas that are uh, maybe potentially good for farming or otherwise. And so there's a lot of conflict between sort of natural forests and being used for human exploitation. And so they are really, really uh, fragmented to an extreme extent. And so studying the remnants of these native forests, I think is important for us to help understand what their diversity looks like. If we just do a quick, I did this as a web of science search on Monday, and we look at publications where we put in tropical type of forest and ectomycorrhizal fungi as search terms, we can see here that in the tropics in general, um, there is 
uh, you know, some good knowledge, uh, particularly in rainforests, so over 100 publications involving ectomycorrhizal fungi cumulatively. Um, that number is much smaller for dry forests, and so it looks like it's closer to 25. And if we zoom into now the neotropics, so focusing here on, in this case, uh, Central and South America, uh, I think there's actually only five publications that came up under those search terms. And so there's still a lot to learn about the ectomycorrhizal fungi in these communities. So I was fortunate to uh, actually be at the University of Minnesota when one of my colleagues who's done a lot of great research on tropical dry forest ecology approached me and said, hey, are you interested in thinking about looking at the mycorrhizal communities or at least the fungal communities in soils from a number of different locations where I'm currently working? And that is work by Jennifer Powers. Uh, she is a professor at the University of Minnesota, and she's done some great work in Costa Rica and has now expanded her work into other tropical dry forests in Colombia, Puerto Rico, and Mexico. This is a larger team. So there are site PIs at each of these locations, and so they deserve a ton of credit for generating lots of data. And I am a very, very small part of this team, but locally in Mexico, uh, Juan de Pou is the host of the sabbatical for me here in Merida, so working at CC, uh, and he's done the research, um, and, uh, particularly on the plant communities in Mexico. And so teaming up with these folks, uh, I was able to get access to a really fantastic set of samples that I think have helped us better understand some of the aspects of tropical dry forest uh, soil fungal communities. So these are the four forests. So these are pictures of what they look like. And so again, we've got Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Puerto Rico. Um, there are some variations across these different forests, as you might imagine, but all are considered intermediate to mature secondary tropical dry forests. Um, there is a lot of variation in uh, both the soil texture and the mineralogy. And so you can see that from the picture here that there's, again, different colors to these soils, uh, different textures, et cetera. And Jennifer and her team, particularly Bonnie Waring, has done some really fantastic work characterizing that. So there are manuscripts that are in the queue as we speak, which will help I think us understand uh, both the soil mineralogy as well as enzyme activities, et cetera. Uh, in this case, I'm just focusing on uh, the soil fungal communities. For me, another interesting factor here is that these four sites represent a real gradient. And so dry forests are, of course, ones that have a period of distinct seasonality. And so unlike the wet forests where rain tends to be relatively homogeneous throughout the year, there are full months of time in tropical dry forests where rain is functionally absent. And so in Colombia, it's a shorter time. And moving from Colombia all the way to Puerto Rico, you can see the vast majority of the year in Puerto Rico on the sites where Jennifer uh, was working uh, are, are dry. And so we have a nice range of, of dry months in this study site, or sorry, in this study system. So briefly to get into the methods, I'm sorry, I don't wanna go too deep into the woods, but I think it is important for you guys to understand where these samples came from. And so again, we have these four sites within each of these four sites as countries, we have four transects. And then along each of those transects, we have 20 different samples. Sampling was done both in the wet and the dry season. And so the total number of samples we were able to analyze was 160 samples. The um, information that comes out of these samples, so there are some basic soil chemical analyses for us to, uh, us to look at. And so in the analyses I'll present, we did look at the effects of variation in soil pH, soil moisture, uh, carbon and nitrogen. And then again, Jennifer and uh, her team, Juan and others, uh, each of these different sites has done an amazing job of characterizing the plant communities um, in terms of all kinds of different metrics. But in this case, we are really interested in looking at things like tree species richness, size, and abundance. Uh, we can also look at mycorrhizal types. And so we used a new um, global database that was just recently published that allows us to then assign mycorrhizal type to the various trees. Um, and for the community assessment, this is based on, again, sort of classic high throughput sequencing, alumina-based um, MySeq. We're focusing on the ITS2 region as our barcode for the fungal community. Uh, briefly, um, I'm going to present graphs in a way that I hope is informative with regards particularly to the ecology of ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so this is comparing what we see for ectomycorrhizal fungi and what we see for the same soil saprotrophic community in the exact same samples. And so we can take fun gill, we can make these different bins, we can pull out the ectomycorrhizal fungi, we can have the saprotrophs. And to me, what I think is helpful is that if we get similar patterns between the ectomycorrhizal fungi and the soil saprotrophs, then we can think of that as probably a general response of the fungi to whatever the variables are that we're interested in. 
But when we see differences, that helps us better understand whether that response is specific to exomycorrhizal fungi. And so how are they, how is their niche defined in these forests relative to say other types of soil fungi? Okay, so here's the first uh, graph. And so what I'm using here is actually a metric that accounts for some of the variation in the number of sequences per sample. And so, again, I don't want to bore you guys with the details, but this is a way for us to account for that. And so we can see that both for the ectomycorrhizal fungi, which is the graph on the left, and for the saprotrophic fungi, which is the graph on the right, that we have some real difference in the richness of those communities based on whether it's a dry season or a wet season sample. In both cases, we see functionally about a doubling of the number of OTUs in those two different types of gilts, whether we're in the dry season or the wet season. So much higher levels in the wet season, so consistently higher richness. And we see that across all four of the sites. And this, I think, is you know, nicely linked to the fact that we know fungi are really pretty fundamentally limited by water availability. And so it's not surprising to see that this richness is higher during the wet season than the dry season. This is a pattern that we see in this case, uh, locally at these four sites, regionally across the four sites, and in some global analyses, similar patterns have shown up as well. So here's when we take different site attributes. So again, we have various soil attributes, we have various plant attributes, and we correlate those with the richness of these different communities. What we saw actually was that the richness of these communities, particularly for ectomycorrhizal fungi, it declines with the richness of the tree community at those sites. So there's a negative relationship. So where there's higher diversity of trees, there's less diversity of ectomycorrhizal fungi. This is a bit of a surprise to us. Um, and so what we see here now is that actually in terms of richness, again, not abundance, but richness, we have a negative correlation between the number of stems that belong to ectomycorrhizal trees and the richness of those ectomycorrhizal communities. Conversely, when we look at the saprotrophic community, we see the richness of saprotrophs tends to go up as the size of the trees in those forests is bigger. And this is represented by the average tree DBH in, again, all these different sites and all of the transects at each of those different sites. A bit surprising to us was the fact that we did not find any significant correlations with any of the soil variables. So there wasn't a significant relationship between richness and factors such as pH or carbon, nitrogen availability, et cetera. So trying to think about how to interpret these results, and so we're still actively working on the manuscripts, and so again, I welcome any comments or suggestions um, about some of this interpretation. Um, but in terms of the negative relationship with, uh, again, fungal richness and site tree richness, there we see actually the site and AM tree richness are very strongly correlated. And so it seems like in this case, what we've got is as you add more trees, most of those are AM trees, and so the availability of those ectomycorrhizal hosts uh, tends to decline, and that may have a negative effect on the richness of those fungal communities. Again, this one is still one that we're scratching our heads about in terms of the opposite pattern has been shown in local data sets, um, as well as in some global data sets. Um, one of the things that's different about these forests, at least the four that we've studied, and I think this is true of new tropical dry forests in general, is the density of ectomycorrhizal host trees tends to be relatively low. And so we never, in this case, got above a about 30% basal area. So of all the stems that are in the forest, those belonging to ectomycorrhizal fungi, that was the high end of our study. And then it drops down from there. And so we may be below some level to which we're seeing if there's enough of these ectomycorrhizal stems, maybe that's what pushes up richness. Again, this is something that we're still actively thinking about. The positive relationship with saprotrophs and site tree size, that one to me I think is a little bit more intuitive in that it's likely that I think these larger trees have probably higher sea inputs into soils, both through litter and through acidates that may favor a more rich saprotrophic community. So this is a big graph. There's lots of things going on, and so I'm going to break this down. I just want to put this up to show now we're shifting into thinking about composition, so not just richness of the community, but actually who's there. And so this, the patterns overall at a broad scale are pretty similar in this case between the ectomycorrhizal and saprotrophic fungal community. So I'm just going to zoom in on the ectomycorrhizal fungi for this part of the talk. 
what we see, and uh, again, for some of you there, I think the shape of this particular PCO, PCOA plot um, is one that is indicative of the fact that we have a really pretty sparse matrix. Um, but there are some, again, I think, real ecological signal in this data set, where what we can see with regards to season is that during the wet season, those are the blue dots, there is much more variation in which ectomycorrhizal fungi are there than during the dry season. And so we think that's probably likely due to less stressful conditions. So when things are wetter, more species are able to persist. We saw that with richness and actually probably more variation in exactly which species are there um, fits into this uh, variation that we're seeing in terms of ectomycorrhizal composition. If we shift to country, this is one that actually was slightly different to our original hypothesis. And so what we see is that in this case, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Colombia are all pulling sort of away from each other in this PCOA space. And Puerto Rico is actually right in the center and pretty much overlapping with all three of these different forest types. Um, and so if we look at the Puerto Rico communities, we really don't see them being different. This is actually where we see the most active mycorrhizal stems relative to Mexico, Colombia, and Costa Rica. And there was a nice paper looking at the floristic uh, diversity of, in this case, tropical dry forests and the neotropics. And what we can see, again, I don't know if my mouse is working or not, but the lower blue is the Antilles. So that's the Caribbean, that's where Puerto Rico would be, is different in this case from, in this case, say Central America. So that would be Costa Rica. In Northern South America, that would be where our Columbia sites are. And then we can see Mexico here in the pink. So there are some differences between what the plant community composition looks like and what we're seeing for the exomycorrhizal community. When we do some ordinations, in this case, we're doing some non-metric multidimensional scaling plots, looking at the plant community composition, we see real differences across these three different communities. And so the colors don't exactly match what I had before, but you can see Puerto Rico is very distinct, in this case, from Mexico, distinct from Costa Rica, as well as from Colombia. And so what's interesting to me is that what this suggests is that there's a weaker link between changes in plant community composition um, and changes in the ectomycorrhizal fungal community composition as well. The last thing uh, is, I think there's a, sort of an interesting potential pattern here, um, looking at an interaction between the effect of which country and then also what season it is. And in particular, again, I apologize, the colors are a little bit hard to tell, but what you can see is that the dry forests of say Mexico, the lighter blue, are in that central cluster and the darker blue Mexico wet forest samples are pulling away. And so there's really some pretty drastic difference. Similarly, you can see something for the dry forest and wet forest of Costa Rica, as well as to some extent to Colombia, whereas the Puerto Rico samples are more overlapping. And so this is interesting to us in that the site that has the most extreme dry seasons probably is limiting to um, both the richness as well as the change in composition of these fungal communities, um, ectomycorrhizal fungal communities. I put this in, um, again, I imagine that for some of you who know who these fungi are, this might be an informative slide for those of you who don't, uh, don't worry. Basically, there's a couple of patterns that pop out. Um, and so you can pick your country of choice and you can look and say which one of these ectomycorrhizal genera was uh, enriched, or you can pick your seasons. For the seasons, actually, one interesting thing was that all of the ectomycorrhizal ascomites, the mice that were in our data set, they actually had higher abundance during the wet season. Um, and so this was a bit of a surprise given that we often think of more stressful environments being dominated by ASCOs and stressful environments are often ones that are, are more dry. So that was a, an interesting difference than what we were expecting. So here's a summary of the study, um, the dry forest study. And so basically uh, to this point, I think we have a pretty good handle on the fact that like many other ectomycorrhizal fungal communities in tropical dry forests, we see a very dynamic community, meaning there is change both in time and in space. However, there are some important differences. So the uh, richness, um, as well as the link to fungal community composition, they don't have these strong positive links that we tend to see in other temperate forests, as well as in other tropical forests. And so I think maybe what's different about these tropical dry forests is that there is this low richness and abundance of hosts to start with, and then you layer that on with a strong abiotic constraint. So you have these really strong gradients, particularly of moisture availability, and that combination may actually break some of this link relative to other forests. Um, and so that's sort of, at the moment, our current interpretation of why we don't see as much of that positive link as we do in other forests. 
And then again, thinking about ectomycorrhizal fungal communities versus saprotrophs, we see some interesting differences. So if we look at that site level, we see that the ectos, their, uh, in this case, richness, um, is more related to host availability. So they correlate with things like site richness of total trees, or in this case, number of ectostems. Um, whereas the saprotrophs are related more to things like tree productivity. And this is a pattern we've seen in other forests, both temperate and tropical, again, suggesting that thinking about these communities ecologically, breaking out ectomycorrhizal fungi and saprotrophs helps us better understand the ecology of each of those two groups. Uh, so we uh, actually have some ongoing work, and this we is really one where I was lucky enough to be collecting uh, some fungi. I was actually on a tour of the botanical garden at uh, CC here in Merida. And we found these uh, Thalephora fruit bodies in the uh, botanical garden. And so we started looking at some of the dry forests around Merida and found some other collections as well. This is work that plugs into work that Roberto um, and Julieta uh, are leading. Uh, they've done a lot of work thinking about tropical dry forests. Thalephora is a particularly interesting lineage in these forests. And so I'm really excited to contribute these specimens to their efforts. Um, and it looks like the species that we have here in Merida is different than some of the other species that we've seen before. And so it'll be exciting to get a new name on this species and to watch Julieta and Roberto push this forward. Okay, uh, so in terms of the um, seminar, I'll switch now to the last of the studies that we've been working on. This is the most new. And so some of these results are literally hot off the press as of yesterday. So <laughs> bear with me um, and uh, apologies in advance if these interpretations, again, are subject to change, but it's been really fun to work on uh, these forests um, that are quite different than the, the dry forests that I just talked about. Um, so in this case, uh, if we think about tropical forests and the different biomes, the rainforest is one that I think for a lot of people that, that comes to mind. These are, of course, areas that have really high plant diversity. They're major carbon sinks globally, so particularly important in terms of carbon cycling. And there has been some better study of these ectomycorrhizal fungal communities in tropical wet forests, and these are lowland forests that I'm gonna talk about. Um, but still, relatively, we're in the early days of better understanding the ecology of these ecosystems. And so I'm gonna walk through, because for me, I needed to be introduced to the different types of forests um, I'm going to start there and then I'll talk about the specific research that we're doing. So when we talk about the lowland wet forests, uh, the Amazon in South America is really uh, in the neotropics, sort of the heart of what I think a lot of people uh, are familiar with. And fortunately, there was a recent publication uh, that's a great summary from lots of research from lots of different researchers that just came out looking at mycorrhizal fungi in South America. There's a couple of chapters that I highlight here. Um, and so Nahara, and colleagues have published one about ectomycorrhizal fungi across South America, so both tropical and temperate. And then there's some work by, again, some of my colleagues that have done some nice specific characterization of the, uh, in this case, endo or arbuscular mycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal communities in tropical forests in Colombia. So I've read those. Um, and as we start to look at the Amazon, we realize that there is a very widely distributed forest type. And so this is often referred to as the Tierra Firme forest. And so this is a non-flooded forest. And it's one that if you look at its soils, they tend to be low in organic matter. So widely distributed, non-flooded, relatively low organic matter. The hosts, the ectomycorrhizal fungal hosts in these systems tend to be uh, in a couple of lineages. So the Nictaginaceae and the Polygonaceae. So again, genera like Nea or Cucoloba. Um, but these are relatively rare. So their abundance is not high. They don't make up sort of a dominant part of the canopy. Um, and there's been some work in these forests. So one nice study that was done by a group of folks um, out of Estonia, so Lejo Tetersu and his group, uh, did some work in Ecuador studying these different ectomycorrhizal fungal communities in lowland terraforming forests, forest. And they found really relatively low fungal species richness, ectomycorrhizal fungal species richness, but high host preference. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that, but I'm trying to give you context for the results that we found from our new studies. So a second forest type that's present in Amazonia um, are what are referred to as white sand forests. And so these are passionately distributed. You can see up here in the upper left part of the slide, uh, the white sand forests are that sort of um, green, uh, brown color that is, again, you can see some of it here um, in Western Amazon, but there are parts of it in Eastern Amazon and Southern Amazon as well. So it's passionately distributed, very sandy, very different adaptically. 
And so it tends to be very nutrient poor and relatively low pHs. That leads to a very different flora. Um, and so the types of plant communities that are there tends to be different. And actually the stature of these forests is different. And so down in the lower left-hand corner here, you can see the picture and where you can see what looks like kind of a depression, that's actually still forest. It's just a shorter statured forest where, again, this is a patch of white sand in a matrix of terra firma forests where the height of the canopy is actually so different that you can see it from these aerial perspectives. In terms of the, um, the plant community and the host of ectomycorrhizal fungi, here we have, in this case, the Fabaceae as, uh, again, probably the dominant uh, hosts in these systems, but they're not monodominant. And so uh, there's been some fantastic work done, uh, particularly in Guyana, looking at um, Fabaceae and monodominant forests, again, in Guyana, uh, led by Terry Henkel and lots of colleagues. Um, but that's not the case in these white sand forests. So these are the hosts but they don't make up the majority of the canopy. Uh, there's been a number of studies, um, one in particular by Melanie Roy and a larger group has looked across Brazil as well as some of the Guiana, so mostly Eastern Amazon. And what they've shown is that in these white sand forests, if you look in the herbaria, um, at some of the collection records, we can see that there seems to be particular lineages that have done well. So they highlight Cortinarius as one of the lineages that is common in white sand forests. And they also posit this idea that, I guess Rolf Singer was the originator of, is the idea that because of this highly endemic, um, in this case, or particularly strong and selective environment, there may actually be relatively high richness. So that there's a strong filter to be part of this community, but in it, there's a diverse mycorrhizal community. So this moves me to a third forest type in Amazonia. And so this is actually work um, that has been in large ways pioneered by my colleague and one of my hosts for part of my sabbatical in Colombia. So that's Aida Vasco Palacios. Um, and Aida and colleagues have worked in these pseudomontes or pseudomonotes forests in Amazonia. Um, these forests are interesting because um, in this case, um, Pseudomonotes uh, tropenbasii is a single species of dipterocarp. And dipterocarps are known as ectomycorrhizal hosts in the old world tropics. In fact, there are huge forests in Asia that are filled with ectomycorrhizal fungi that are dominated by dipterocarps. But this is the one representative that we have in the new world and it's endemic to the Western Amazon. And the study of it's been done locally in Colombia. Um, I say forests in quotes because really uh, it looks like the distribution of this particular X mycorrhizal host is very patchy. And so there are patches where you find this host. And so you can see the leaves and the greater amount of leaf litter in these patches where in this case, P. tropenmaciae becomes more abundant. There tends to be more organic matter associated with it. And again, Aida and other folks have worked on this community. Um, they've characterized many new fungal species. So new species of Sarcodon, of Amanita, and they've shown that the diversity in these forests looks like it's comparable even uh, to these monodominant forests that have been more, again, um, intensively studied in other parts of the Amazon. So uh, <clears throat> with regards to the study and the work that we've done most recently, this is a collaboration again with Aida. I've been working with a really fantastic graduate student um, at uh, the Universidad Nacional de Colombia um, in Medellin, Sebastián González Caro, who is a ecologist, a forest ecologist. Uh, he's worked a lot on uh, the phylogenetic diversity of Amazonian forests. And um, he has helped uh, Aida and I add some extra perspectives in the study of these fungal communities. So in the lower left, we have Colombia. And so we're in the very, very bottom southeast corner of Colombia. You can see this little hopefully um, Zafire Biological Station flag. Uh, so that is where the samples come from for this study. And the cool thing about Zafire is that it actually has, in this case, all of these three different forest types that I just mentioned in very close proximity. And so Aeda traveled to Zafire in September, made some collections. So we have multiple replicates of each of these different forest types. And in particular, we wanted to look to see how consistent is the community between different patches of P. tropenbaciae. We have samples, again, in the surrounding forest where, again, the abundance of ectomycorrhizal fungal hosts is low, the terraforming forest, more representative of lots of Amazonia, and then these interesting white sand forests as well. And so what we decided to do was we sequenced the DNA and we used the kind of classic high throughput sequencing that we've, uh, again, I presented the results from for the tropical dry forests, and that would be the MySeq alumina-based ITS2 sequencing. 
But we had an opportunity to also sequence these um, same samples using some new longer read sequencing technology. Uh, it's referred to as MinION or the Oxford Nanopore technology. And this is important for reasons that I'll talk about later on. And I've been super lucky um, that John Palmer has kindly added his expertise to our team. And so he's really helped in helping us stitch together these two different data sets. And I'll talk about that at the very end here in just a minute. So if we look at the richness of these communities by forest site, so again, we've got these two patches of P. tropomaceae. We've got the terra firme forest, we've got the white sand forest. And what was interesting for us to see is at least in these samples, we see both for the ectomycorrhizal fungi and for the sapertrophs that there's actually quite a lot of parity in the richness of these communities. And they really seem to be pretty similar, both within the patches as well as across these three forest types. And so that's interesting in the sense that some of the previous research has suggested, for example, that tropical terra firme forests were lower in richness, um, but we don't see that uh, relative to the samples that we took. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, Sebastian has been instrumental for us in making this uh, new part of the analysis possible. But what we were able to do was use a tool that recently came out. Um, so Martin Ryberg, uh, who's at Uppsala University in Sweden, uh, has built a uh, user-friendly web tool that anybody can access. And so using the taxonomy that comes out of the OTU pipeline um, from high throughput sequencing, we can generate a backbone skin trained tree. And so we can make sure that we have a good alignment across all of kingdom fungi for these various different functional guilds. Um, and so here's a link to uh, Martin's tool. There's details about that approach in a paper that was recently published by, again, Leho Tedersu and his group of which Martin's a co-author. And what this did was this allowed us to then also now not just estimate the OTUs, but also the phylogenetic richness that we see in these communities. And doing that, we see again, a similar pattern where the richness in terms of the phylogenies, the lineages that are represented across these different, in this case, forest types is actually very similar, both for the ectomicrosal fungi and for the saprotrophic fungal communities. Uh, if we look at the dispersion of those lineages, this is where, to me, things get interesting. And there's been some nice work. There's a huge body of literature thinking about phylogenetic community ecology. I will super fast brief, <laughs> briefly try to orient you into that. But again, there's a, a, a really large literature on this topic. But we can measure communities from a phylogenetic perspective using different types of metrics. Uh, there are two common metrics. So one is what's referred to as a net relative index. The other is referred to as the nearest taxon index. Both of these are basically taking the phylogeny that you have, comparing that to a randomized version of that phylogeny, and then making a score. And so you can interpret those scores. And in terms of interpreting those scores, when you have a high NRI or a high NTI score, that means that you're seeing more clustering, so more closely related communities than you would see based on random chance alone in your various samples. The difference between NRI and NTI is thinking more about sort of the deeper parts of your tree, and so differences in, say, orders, uh, classes, um, so deeper nodes, whereas NTI is thinking more about those tips, so the species or the OTUs that are in your data set. So here's the summary of what that data looks like across these, again, three forest types. So within uh, the top part here, so the upper right graph, you can see the NRI for ECM fungi, not different than what we would see based on chance alone, um, although trending towards, in this case, more phylogenetic uh, clustering in white sand forests. In contrast for NRI, so this again is at the sort of deeper order level, um, we see that for saprotrophic fungal communities, there is a big difference, trending towards, uh, in this case, less phylogenetic clustering um, in the white sand forest, but also some variation between white sand forests and what we see in the P. tropenbaceae forest. So some, some important differences suggesting that, again, which big phylogenetic lineages are there uh, is different um, in these different forest types and then across these two functional guilds. And the bottom graph shows that when we think about the actual tips of these phylogenetic trees that we've made for each of these guilds, we can see that in the white sand forest, there is a significant over clustering um, of the white sand ectomycorrhizal fungal communities, meaning they're more closely related to each other than randomly. And that's different from what we see in those other patches. 
Conversely, we don't see that for the saprotrophic fungal community. So some interesting differences again there. So if we look at the composition of these plots, we can use just a simple Venn diagram, which I think is actually pretty informative in this case. So we've got the two different, on your left, you've got the ectomycrosal fungi, on the right, you've got the saprotrophic fungi. And we can see that actually, if we look across the four samples, the three forest types for ectomycrosal fungi, we see no shared OTUs, which is pretty striking, especially relative to the saprotrophic fungi, where we see a good number of OTUs shared. And of those OTUs, I can't show it here, but those tend to be some of the most common. So we just don't see the same sort of filter on OTU composition in saprotrophic fungal communities that we see for the ectomycorrhizal fungal communities. Um, and I'll try and talk about that a little bit more in just another slide. Similarly, if we think about the ectomycorrhizal fungal communities and thinking about where these communities are assembling from, interestingly for us, the terra firme forest seems like it's sort of this intermediate between what we see in the, again, P. tropenbaceae forests, so the dipterocarp forests, and then those white sand forests that are dominated in this case by members that are Fabaceae, so uh, the genus Dicimbi aldina. Um, and so we can see here that, you know, this tends to have some overlap. The TFF group overlaps and shares a number of taxa with both, whereas the white sand forests really don't share any taxa with the P. tropenbaceae forests. Uh, so a couple more views of how this looks. And so one of the questions that gets a lot of discussion in high throughput sequencing is what's the best way to analyze this data? Luckily, we're seeing some pretty similar patterns, whether we analyze the data based on just presence absence or whether we use read counts as a metric of abundance. So these are plots where we're, again, we're looking at dispersion in these fungal communities. And what we can see here for the ECM fungal community or the SAP community down at the bottom is that the white sand community uh, both for the ectos and the sap communities, tends to break out as separate. So those are those red dots in those clusters that are further away. However, for the ectomycorrhizal community, we see more differentiation, where we see the terra firme forests also breaking away from the P. tropenbaceae forests. And the P. tropenbaceae forests are mixed together, as we might expect. For the sap fungi, the terra firme forests and the P. tropenbaceae forests are actually quite mixed. If we add in, in this case now, abundance, the perspective gets a little bit more mixed for ECM fungi, but again, we really see the white sand communities as ones that are pretty different in composition from those of the other forest types that we studied. And then we can also do this from a phylogenetic perspective. And we can see yet again, that there is not only differences in, in this case, uh, the number, uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't say that because we didn't see differences in richness, but uh, which fungi are there, but which lineages of fungi are there, both for the ectos and the saps, with the white sand forest having a really different composition than um, in, in the white sand forest than the other three forest locations that we studied. I don't expect you to read uh, what the x-axis is here. I'm sorry that it's very small, but I'm just trying to show you actually the big picture. If we just look at, say, these rank abundance plots, we can see that there's some differences in the structure of these communities. Uh, you can see, for example, that the white sand forest tends to have much more skew. So there's this really high dominance of ectomycorrhizal fungi and the Tomatella delephora lineage relative to others. Interestingly, the terra firme forest, uh, it's more even. So you can see a, a much more shallow decline from, say, the left to right in that graph. And it looks like actually Entoloma is the dominant ectomycorrhizal genus uh, that's present in those forests. Um, and the P. tropenbaceae forests tend to be relatively similar, although there are a few differences between the two if you look closely. Finally, uh, we've done some other analyses. And so uh, what we can do is we can analyze the whole, again, sort of phylogeny for all the ectomycorrhizal fungi that are present. And what we can see is that the Thalephoraleus in particular is one that's pretty highly diversified. Um, and so this is down in this part of the graph, uh, which is the lower left part. Um, I don't know if my, again, my arrow is showing up or not, but we have different representatives of the lephora across various, in this case, white sand forests. So, so a high uh, range of diversification in that lineage uh, relative to others. Um, we see that within the agaricomycetes, so up at this sort of higher level, um, there's uh, diversity within the terra firme forest, so lots of different lineages of mostly gilled mushrooms um, in this case. And if we switch to the, the boletes, um, we can see actually down in this corner that there's some interesting overlap, again, suggesting that the terra firme forests and the P. tropenbaceae forests tend to share more of a similar composition phylogenetically than what we're seeing in those white sand forests, particularly within this lineage. 
So to summarize what we've uh, found to date, uh, again, we've seen that the richness actually is notably similar across these different Amazonian forest types. Um, uh, and yet we're seeing significant phylogenetic clustering um, of uh, you know, that NRI and that NTI index in these white sand forests. So they're equally rich, but they are distinct in terms of which lineages are there. And the composition is different, whether we look at the OTU level or we look at the phylogenetic level, in terms of ectos, we really see these striking differences that there isn't a single, in this case, taxa in our study that we found in all four of the sites. Um, and we do see this trend where, again, the Pipitropombatia forests look a bit more like the terra firma forests than they do like those uh, adjacent white sand forests. So I think I have time, um, but I'm, I might actually skip this just to make sure that there's time for questions. Um, so Another challenge in working in these new systems is whether the taxa that we get back from our sequencing, uh, we believe or not. And so uh, I've got some examples here. We think, for example, that we are seeing Wilcox Sina and reporting it and that it's it's real. Um, but there are some other lineages on our data set that may either be you know, contaminants that we picked up in the lab or otherwise that I'm not sure are actually real, even though we have a few OTUs that belong to these different groups. So what I want to do is I wanna talk just briefly, and again, I apologize, COVID has sort of slowed down, I imagine for everybody, uh, the research that we've all had a chance to work on over the last couple months. And so our hope was to push this a lot further when um, I'd originally signed up with Camille to give the seminar, but it's been a bit slower, but I can give you some data on thinking about how we're now interested in going forward. And so we have this Illumina data set, and so the results that I showed you um, are from that. Illumina is great because it has a relatively low cost per base. It's got a really relatively high accuracy on that base calling. However, it amplifies a relatively short region. So you can pick your barcoding region. Um, and the challenge with that is that if you only have a short uh, amount of information, the ability to differentiate that from everything else in say a given database is lower than if we had more information. So if we want better identification of these tropical fungi, particularly ones that aren't well represented in the database, we really need to have uh, longer reads. So uh, Oxford Nanopore is this cool uh, third generation technology. So this is a covalence effect bio, some of these long read sequencing platforms, but this one has some real interesting advantages. Uh, it does have currently a higher cost per base, although that's coming down. Um, it also has notably a lower base accuracy. That's important. we will talk about that in a second. But this thing is actually a little dongle that attaches to your computer. And so you can have this, it's quite portable and it amplifies this longer reads that we would want to have, again, better potential to identify these fungi if they're present in the databases or at least in, again, phylogenetic analyses. So the individual sequencing rates are relatively high, but if you do enough sequencing, which you can do um, at relatively reasonable costs, you can make consensus reads from each of those individually, which look very accurate. And this has been validated in multiple studies from multiple groups. Um, the other thing is that it allows you to sequence both on site. So you could in theory take this into the Amazon, um, but you can also sequence at your bench top in your lab in a location. And you don't need to pay $300,000 to get a sequencing machine. These things start at about 1500 bucks. And so the starting cost to get this information is much, much lower than it would be for other long range sequencing technologies. So at the moment, what we're trying to do is use basically a hybrid approach where we take these, what we know are good, accurately uh, called MySeq OTUs, and then we sequence the exact same sample with, again, the MinION, and we have these much longer reads, and we use those MySeq OTUs as a way to then pull out those longer reads that belong to each of those different MySeq OTUs. And so this is what the platform looks like. And so again, this is work that John Palmer has been the lead on, and uh, it's basically what we're referring to as a seed and extend approach. And so we take, okay, so here's up top as your gene region. So in this case, we're sequencing ribosomal RNA, depending on length is what you're going across. And so you can see that if we amplify just one of the ITS regions, it tends to be relatively short. That's what we sequence with Lumina, and that's what you see on the left there, and that can be clustered nodes used. That's kind of the classic, what we've done for a lot of HTS. In this case, we sequence a much larger region. So we have all of ITS plus a good chunk of the LSU region. And we can take those MySeq OTUs and then using basically an iterative process where we seed in those MySeq OTUs, we can pull out the corresponding pieces in the Oxford Nanopore reads, and we can repeat that process in a way that allows us to generate uh, consensus reads that we feel confident about. 
So what does this look like? Well, I'll just give you one example. And so in this case, so far of the 2900 OTUs, again, this is early days, so we're still trying to set parameters, but we've been able to extend about a third of all OTUs that were in the MySync data set to have more than 800 base pairs worth of sequence length. And of those, the vast majority, the mean length of these is actually now 1300 base pairs. And so we have full length ITFs, we have the D2, the D1 regions of LSU. And so to be able to look at these from a more informed phylogenetic perspective is really, I think, more promising. Here's one interesting example. So OTU 179 in our MySeq data set is a scleroderma species. Uh, for those of you who don't know scleroderma, this is a, in this uh, case, a gastroid um, fungus. Um, and so uh, they tend to be on the ground, these little ball like structures. Um, when we now look at OTU79 with this seed and extend approach, we have almost 1,500 base pairs worth of data. And if we do a quick blast search of that, we actually get a 97% match to a sporocarp that was collected in French Guiana in a Dicimbi Cornobosa forest um, in that location. So it suggests that here we are in Colombia sampling these soils, and yet we have a really, really close match now to that particular scleroderma species, which was found in a totally different part of the Amazon and in fact, in a very different forest. So for us, what's interesting is that the white sand forest is where we have dicembi trees in Colombia. We have a different species, but we didn't see it at all in the white sand forest. Instead, we saw it in both of the Petrocombasii forests as well as the terra firma forests. And so to me, what's exciting about this is this now helps us not only think about the biogeography of these fungi, but think more holistically potentially, again, about the ecology of these really interesting mycorrhizal symbionts. So a brief summary here of the seminar. I hope that today I've given you a chance to think more about a couple of different things. One is this community resource that we built called Fun Guild. This is one that, again, I think helps us understand from an ecological perspective how different guilds of fungi are functionally affecting the ecosystems they're in. We welcome, would love contributions from the community. Uh, this is really meant to be something that we all work on uh, and get the benefits of. And so please feel free to contribute and use FunGuild as much as possible. Uh, with regards to the neotropical dry forests, the ECM fungal communities that we're seeing here, um, they tend to be, as we've seen uh, temp temporally, so between wet and dry seasons, spatially across these different countries, quite variable. Um, but we're missing that positive link that we've seen in other forests with regards to ECM plant richness and composition. So that's uh, notable. And then in the neotropical wet forests, again, now we're seeing this pattern where from a conservation perspective, it really suggests that there are, there's actually more similarity in terms of overall richness, but each of these different forest types has a particularly, um, uh, you know, sort of phylogenetically rich and distinct community. And so conservation of each of these different forest types is something that is really quite important given the differences in composition. Uh, so I want to finish here and just say thank you uh, again to the collaborators. I feel incredibly lucky to have worked with um, two great teams. Um, again, one centered in Colombia, so Aida and Sebastian, John Palmer have been the folks that have worked uh, with me the most on the tropical wet forest uh, studies. And then uh, the dry forest studies, again, have been mostly worked with Jennifer and then my sabbatical host, Juan. Uh, had some help from some undergrads, uh, some funding. Uh, this is a picture that Minnesota doesn't look like this right now, but this is outside my office window. Uh, it does tend to be quite cold there, but we tend to do mycology year round. So uh, with that, I will say thank you again, Camille, for this opportunity. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be super happy to take any questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that I hopefully can see you guys. Um, okay. And then I'll, I, I guess I go back to the share screen option, Camille. Is that okay? Yes, can you see us? I can see you again now, so that helps. Can You can't see yourself. And let me see, did that come up? Yes, I can see you. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, wow, there's a bunch of live comments. I'm excited to okay. read those later, yes. sorry. Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. As you can see on the live chat, we had many public from all over Latin America, so. I think everyone was really exciting to, to listen to you. So the first question that we have is from Julieta Alvarez. And she's asking, in the tropical dry forest, did you look at the monodominance of some ECM hosts, explaining the richness of the ECM fungi? 
Uh, so um, that's a good question. Thank you, Julieta. Um, in terms of the uh, drive for us, at least that we worked in, we didn't have any particular sites where the dominance of ECM host was very high. And so I caveat our results to, uh, again, I think we've done a good job of characterizing different drive forests that are representative of lots of what tropical drive forest is, but it's a diverse ecosystem biome. And so, um, as I said earlier, the composition only got up to about 30% of a forest, particularly in Puerto Rico, that had, uh, in this case, ectomycorrhizal hosts. And that was really dominated by a couple of different species of Pisonia. There was a few other lineages there, but it was not super rich. Um, so I don't, um, I don't think I have a great answer for you with regards to tropical dry forest monodominance. We didn't focus at all on say mono, classic monodominance in the wet forests either, right? And so the classic monodominant forests in South America are those in say uh, Guiana, uh, the Dicimbi forest, the Aldina forests. Um, and those uh, are where the canopy is really, really mostly all ectomycorrhizal. Um, you know, the, the P. trophimbaceae patches are, you know, they may be 10% of the community uh, canopy composition. And similarly, in the white sand forests, you have Dicembe, you have Aldina, but they're, you know, three, four, five percent um, of that community. And so th they tend to be more sparse and, and even less so in the terra firma forests. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the next question is from Mariana Garcia, who is asking, in these dry ecosystems, how could you assess the endemism of fungal species? Yeah. yeah, that's a really, wow, fantastic question. And I'm honestly not 100% sure that high throughput sequencing is the best approach, although I think it can give us some hints potentially into some of that endemism. And so we are seeing some regional scale biogeography um, in terms of the composition varying across these different locations. Um, in the four sites that we looked at, uh, again, the kind of broader patterns that we saw were a bit surprising. We figured that the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, which was physically isolated, right, being part of the uh, Antilles, uh, might be different. We might see a more endemic community. Um, we didn't really see that in terms of composition. But I think that actually some of the detailed work that, um, again, Roberto Julieta are working on, uh, others in these tropical dry forests, and there are, there are many, right? And so this is the sort of tip of the iceberg. There are huge dry forests in Brazil, for example, in the Neotropics, uh, where you have specimens, and we can carefully look at those specimens, and hopefully we can do more collecting. Um, I think as more people look, we're going to define the distributions of these fungi more successfully using both specimens as well as uh, some of these sequencing approaches. And so I'm convinced uh, that, at least from what I've seen throughout my career, that there are a number of patterns that are present in plant communities that tend to also be similar in fungal communities. And so I would be very surprised if there was not an endemic set of fungi, particularly ectomycorrhizal fungi, in these tropical dry forests. And for example, the work from Julieta um, in Chamela in the you know, sort of western part of Mexico has shown, again, these unique host communities uh, that have different fungal communities that are similar at, say, uh, the genus level, but there are likely a number of new species in these dry forests as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next questions come from Jesus Perez, who would like to know, what do we know about the structural and functional relevance of external ECM mycelium in your tropical ecosystems, which is one of the most important components of the ECM symbiosis? Right. So, you know, that's a good question. And again, another important caveat to the approach that we used in terms of we're sequencing soils. And so because we're sequencing soils, we're sequencing mycelium. We may be sequencing most of the time we sieved all the soil very carefully. So we got rid of root tips, but there could also be spores that are present in these communities. And so we have to be careful about how we interpret this data. I think the majority of what we've sequenced um, likely is represented by mycelium. Uh, but, you know, as you said, the role of the mycelium in exploring these environments and extracting, in this case, nutrients or water um, is fundamental to the success of many of these plants. Um, and there are notable differences. And so we can use things like exploration type as a way to classify these different fungal genera that we found in these different locations. We haven't done that in the tropical dry forest or wet forest analyses to date. Um, that would be a fun extra trait to layer on and see if there are some trends that are, 
are there. Um, we see a little bit of a pattern where we don't see a lot of long distance exploration types in the tropical dry forests. Um, and that may be that the productivity of those forests is on average lower, particularly in the dry season. And so it may be more energetically expensive to support these longer, larger mycelium. Um, but that's, again, sort of, uh, we've got some hints. Um, I think these data sets maybe provide some good hypotheses, but, but we need more study of these for us. So great question. I hope we can do more to answer it. Yes. So we have another question from Julieta, who would like to know, is plant gen general diversification in Amazonia a highly correlated by soil type, but did you find correlation between ECM diversity and soil type? So, uh, you know, I, I think the, the short answer to that is we're working at a relatively local scale. And so I think that's important to keep in mind, uh, depending on how you define diversity. So if you're defining it based on richness, we didn't see differences in richness. Um, we have looked at richness plus evenness, which is the classic metric for diversity. We don't also see differences in that case. So depending on how you feel about using abundance data for HDS. Um, and so that was interesting. That was actually a surprise because in some previous work by Ada, there had been differences. We had seen lower richness in the white sand forests in the same sites. Uh, it turns out there was a disturbance recently before they had sampled previously. And so maybe without that disturbance, but we did not see a link to richness and soil type at this local scale. Um, which again was surprising, but to me further suggests based on the phylogenetic analysis that we need to think about each of these different ecosystems as ones that are these kind of enriched in different lineages. And so while their overall OTU richness may be similar, which fungi are in these communities may be different. And that links to traits and those traits may be linked to, again, the soil types that you see. So there's been work in Borneo by Kabir Pei and others. And we see, for example, the Thalephoralis is overrepresented in this case, the very sandy white sand soils in Colombia. What does that mean functionally? I don't know if we know that yet, but I think that linking, you know, this is something, again, it's a broader literature, but you can use the phylogeny to help us then think about species traits that may be important for these strong environmental filters that we see in these different forests. The next question is from Roberto Garibay, who would like to know, given the seasonality in Puerto Rico and the strong influence of hurricane disturbances, do you think the constrained ECM community there represent a kind of resistance community? Yeah, that's a really interesting yeah. question as well. Uh, <laughs> I know uh, some folks in your lab, Roberto, are working on the effects of hurricanes on uh, fungal communities and dry forests. I'm actually quite excited to read and learn more about the work that you guys are doing. Um, but thinking about disturbance as a potentially limiting factor is important. I will say, while I haven't gotten to visit any of the four sites, unfortunately in person, I've just seen their very different colored soils, um, that the Puerto Rico sites are actually relatively old. Um, and so they are among the most mature of the four sites that we have. And so the effect of disturbance locally in our particular study, um, hurricane disturbance, I don't think is a big driver of the data set. Um, but I think that, you know, there are certainly important things to think about with hurricanes potentially selecting for different plant lineages. I don't know, wood density, susceptibility to hurricanes, how that changes plant community composition. But then the effect of the disturbance itself as a big input of all these nutrients and other things is important. So um, that's, I guess that's my, you know, what's on the top of my head. Um, but like I said, the Puerto Rico sites that we sampled were were relatively mature. Um, and so I, I don't think there was any recent hurricanes that would have signaled and changed the richness um, in those communities relative to the others. Mm -hmm. The next questions come from Sergio Diaz. He would like to know, when you, how do you combine the ATS data and species identification and description? Having in mind, there is a lot of species that are undescribed and some of them are microscopic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, them for mycologists, I guess. <laughs> right. So we need more mycologists. So please, please, Sergio, keep working on what you're working on and, and everybody. Um, uh, I actually, maybe I, I don't mean to put Camille on the spot here, but I think she's published actually quite a nice paper on this topic about how to know fungi in understudied ecosystems. Um, and Absolutely. I think that we really need a combined approach where in theory, um, you know, having specimens is absolutely key. 
I mean, one of the big questions that I'm puzzled with is what is the limiting factor? Is it the databases are not filled with enough representatives that we're not matching well when we sequence in tropical systems? Is that it? Or is it the short reads are what are not allowing us to match and the databases are decently populated? I think that's where getting at the MySeq versus the Oxford Nanopore data and stitching those together. If we see drastic differences, when we extend, so we can do a better job of identifying the fungi. Will that help us significantly in terms of inferring their ecology, assigning guilds, et cetera? That's where I, I see this as sort of an intermediate step. I 100% agree that matching HTS data to species identification and description is limited. I guess I will also say that this depends on kind of how you want to approach the question. Um, I, as an ecologist, I feel like, you know, I'm sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place where, you know, I want species level descriptions, but I do think at the same time, we can learn a lot about, you know, who's there, even based on which genera are present in some of these ecosystems in terms of what the ecological functioning might look like. So um, I think Camille's paper is great. I would look at that. Um, I'm excited to look at our data. John and I are actively exploring that right now um, and we'll work hard to push this stuff out and put it forward. But thank you for the, the question. I, I totally agree that, you know, under description makes things really challenging and you will, even with a nice long 1500 base pair stretch, you know, if there's absolutely nothing that is represented in the database, um, you're still going to end up with a, a SPA, but we know it better than <laughs> the, the little SPA that we knew when it was just the MICE data. Yeah, I think I would add that uh, it's good to uh, complement your study with specimens, but also culture and fungi for fungal endophytes. This really helps to identify the next genome sequencing data. Absolutely. I wish I wish ectomycorrhizal fungi grew better. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. For, for, for mycorrhizal fungi, it's difficult, but for endophytes, which are very often very abundant in these data sets and also difficult to identify, it really helps to. That's right. Yeah. yeah, good point. So the next question is from Rodolfo Angeles, who would like to know about extending the Illumina audios with Mignon. How do, do you deal with multi copy of visible re and macro? Yeah, so it's, uh, again, this is pretty early days, and so John and I are still trying to work this out. So what I think you're talking about, Rodolfo, um, which, hello, good to see you, man. I'm glad that you were able to make this talk. Congratulations on being a doctor now, I think, since we've last seen each other. Um, but uh, so it's the idea of uh, heterozygosity within the ITS region um, is challenging because you have, in this case, say, the same fungus and you know multiple different types of ITS per that fungus. So um, we've tried to, in this case, limit um, the way that we're searching and we're doing this in this iterative process where we're stepping through and extending, but we're trying to do it in a careful way because actually if you bring in too many closely related taxa, you actually end up further from the truth in what that actual starting ITS2 uh, MySeq OTU is relative to what the consensus read is. And so at each of those different steps, we're changing, so we're trying to, it's just this balance between getting a longer read, but getting a true read. And, and that balance is actually a weird trade-off. And so I don't think we have it all super worked out yet. Um, you know, I think it's one that is on the table. So it's a great question to ask. Um, we have some mock communities. Uh, we've done a lot thinking about ribosomal copy number. We've published papers that we can actually estimate what that is for different fungi. So, Maybe when I get back to Minnesota, if I can get back into the lab, we can <laughs> do some more precise uh, quantification of this type of question, but it's it's a good one. Um, it's something that should be on our mind as we think about how these data sets come together. Mm -hmm. And so we have another question from Rodolfo, who would like to know from a macroecological perspective, how are the fungal lineages of the dry and wet tropical forests related to the fungal communities in temperate near tropical forests? Yeah. So um, I think, you know, what I would do is I'd encourage you to go actually and look at the review that was written by um, Adriana Corrales mm -hmm. and Matt and Terry. Um, they've talked about that. There's a few lineages, particularly in Guyana, that have been identified. The uh, Guayana Rica lineage is one that looks like it's a unique endemic tropical lineage. Um, it's different uh, than the uh, ectomycorrhizal communities that you would see in temperate forests. Um, but there are some you know, sizable overlap in terms of which lineages are present. So there was some 
you know, early work suggesting that clavulina was really well represented in tropical forests. We do see that in temperate forests as well. We hardly saw any clavulina in our data set in Colombia, but Aida has seen it in other uh, data sets that she's looked at from Colombia. So again, that might be just our local sampling relative to others. Um, there wasn't, I would say, wildly different lineages in terms of what was represented. There's, you know, again, some interestingly different lineages um, in terms of particularly as you get down into, um, you know, certainly genera and species, uh, you tend to see some tropical endemics that uh, aren't present at all in, uh, say, temperate forests. Um, but in the dry forests, um, again, I think this representation of telephora, for example, telephora is quite common in in, in um, temperate latitudes tends to be common in more disturbed habitats in temperate latitudes, whereas you know what we're sampling is relatively more mature habitats in tropical lineages. So there might be some interesting differences in ecology that even if the lineage is the same, depending on which you know location or latitude you're looking at, it, it may actually have a, a pretty different um, comparison. And what we want to do now that we have the longer reads is actually do some detailed phylogenetic analysis mm -hmm. of the tropical fungi. So take all of the entelomataceae and put our entelomas that we got from Columbia into that and find out where do they fall out um, and how do they, are they next to the temperate lineages? Are they in their own little clade? So great question. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're, we're still working on that. Yeah, I see a lot to do. <laughs> and so we have a last question again from Rodolfo, who would like to know, aside from geographic endemism, did you find anything that points to the Eastern fungal specificity of the host? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, I mean, in some ways, I think the Columbia data set is to me, so, so, so I love that question because actually a lot of the research in my lab is focused on these interesting actomycorrhizal fungi that tend to show strong patterns of host specificity. And so switching into these tropical systems um, is to me exciting to see, do we see some of that or not? Uh, the ex last example that I presented was one that to me I find pretty fascinating. So the scleroderma, right, that we had in our data sets. We see it in Colombia, um, but we don't see it in the Dicembi forests um, that are present in Colombia, and yet it's in the Dicembi forests in Guyana, and yet it's in multiple samples in the adjacent forest for white sand and for the, you know, uh, dipterocarp, the P. tropenbaceae. And so, so uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to really start to, I would say, feel like this data set allows us to mm -hmm. talk strongly about patterns of specificity. Um, I think that we can make those local comparisons in our own studies, but that is a great example that shows that as soon as we broaden out a little bit in our perspective, all of a sudden we've got now a lack of specificity, right? So this scleroderma seems to like, you know, Petropenbasia, it likes Nea, it likes Cocoloba, it likes a different species of Dicindi. So I, I think we're, we're gonna have to work together as a community to you know, continue the sampling and then make those comparisons to, to better understand this pattern in a larger scale. Mm -hmm. We have a comment here from Aida Vasco about Clavulina, who say they are quite common in Amazonian forests and this, lies, this clade is diverse too, but we do not detect it in the study. So yeah, maybe more, more sampling. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the interesting thing for us was that we, so so I think one of the studies I showed says that, you know, sampling multiple times a year is really important because you get differences in richness and composition in the dry forest in particular. But, uh, you know, we just have this one sort of snapshot. So we've sort of traded time for space in the Colombian forest. And so I think there is some, while we now have representation of multiple samples per forest type, which is new in this study, um, you know, there, it's, in, it's important to put that in context that it is just one sampling time. Mm -hmm. And so we have a last minute question here from Adriana Corrales, <laughs> who would like to know uh, how you were able to identify Lantoloma as one of the most abundant ECM in the Colombian Amazonian forest. Yeah, so again, this is based on just the MySeq, uh, hydrobit sequencing data set that we had. And so the, what we did was, Entoloma gets flagged as an active mycorrhizal genus by Fungild, um, but it gets flagged as possible because most of Entoloma is actually saprotrophic. And so what I did was carefully look at each of the Entoloma OTUs that was in the data set. I individually matched them back to the UNITE data set. And so there's a EM ecology function that's in the UNITE data set where Leho and others have gone through and been, I think, pretty careful to show that not all Entolomas are the same. And so we needed to rely on 
where in Ensaloma these different OTs are coming from. And so I only accepted ones that were actually ectomycorrhizal in that part of the data. There are many other Ensalomas in the Columbia data set that I put in Sapertrophe because they were not in the ectomycorrhizal lineage. Um, so that's an example where, again, FunGuild is a great tool, but as a, you know, one of the people who started this, I'm thrilled that people are using this tool, but I think it can be used more effectively if you don't just stop at the output, but you keep digging. It's almost necessary where I think we've tried to, you know, bridge you so far, but it's not necessarily getting you all the way to the other side, to the ecology that you want. And so exploring with more depth, I think is helpful. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Adrian. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it at some other time too. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the end of the seminar. Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, accepting our invitation. And thank you everyone to follow us every Tuesday. So I remind you that next Tuesday, we have the talk from Arturo Becerra from the Faculty of Science of UNAM, um, which title is Los primeros dos mil millones años de vida en la Tierra. Muchas gracias a todos para estar con nosotros hoy. Y muchísimas gracias a Peter para aceptar nuestra invitación. Y entonces el próximo martes a las 11 tendremos, tendremos el seminario del doctor Arturo Becerra de la Facultad de Ciencias de la UNAM titulado Los primeros mil millones años de vida en la Tierra. Ok, thank you, Peter. Ah, I thank hope you see you soon me. in Mexico City. <laughs> Likewise, stay well, and everybody who's watching, please stay well. Thank you again for this opportunity.